Good morning. It's a joy to see each of you here this morning. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here this morning uh, because we are new creations in Christ. And as new creations, uh, He has called us to walk in the newness of life. And so as we gather here as God's new creations, He has invited us to worship Him. And so we begin by a reading from God's Word. Matthew chapter 28, familiar verses. Let's hear from the Lord through His Word. Matthew 28, starting in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw Him, they worshipped Him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord, and at God's invitation we are able to worship Him. Would you stand as we sing our hymn of adoration? seated. Let's praise the Lord our God in prayer. Father, we are here to worship you, not by trying to draw you down uh, to us by worldly gimmicks, but rather by drawing near to you through the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. We praise you that you have all authority in heaven and on earth. We praise you that you have made us new creations in Christ and raised us to walk in a new way of life. We praise you that you allow us to be a part of your mission of making disciples of all nations. And now, Lord, would you bless this service of worship, that we might truly worship you in spirit and in truth. We pray that any unbelievers here today would be convicted by this service, called to account that the secrets of their heart would be disclosed, and they would fall on their face, worship you, and declare that you really are among us. 
We know all of this is possible by your Spirit and by your Son, and it's in His name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing our hymn of confession at Calvary? As that chorus says, mercy there was great, and grace was free. We had to pay nothing uh, for our salvation. Uh, and in 1 Corinthians, it says, uh, verse, I'm sorry, in chapter 15, verse 54, it says, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is is the law, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, we have assurance of our salvation, and we can sing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Let's sing that together. (laughs) 
seated. Father, we thank you for this day that we can gather here with you together to worship you. And we thank you for this blessed assurance that, um, that our salvation is in you. Lord, we pray that as Pastor Charles comes to preach the word this morning, that, um, that we would, our hearts would be opened uh, to how, uh, how you will speak to us this morning. And we thank you for that. And we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you, Justin and Choir, uh, for leading us in our congregational singing. Thank you, Gail, again, for your willingness to fill in and help us, and um, we appreciate that very much. Would you take your copy of God's Word and turn to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6. We'll begin reading there in verse 1 in just a moment. You know, sometimes a speaker says more than they intend, more than they realize at the time. I found that especially to be true in a, in a scene of a movie that I've watched countless times, but one time as I was thinking about it, it struck me in a, in a new way. The film is, is the classic movie, uh, The Searchers, starring John Wayne, uh, directed by John Ford. It's one of the greatest, not just Westerns, but movies of all time. And it tells the story of a, of a girl who'd been kidnapped by a, a band of warring Comanche Indians. And the film is about those who are searching for her, those who are seeking to find her and bring her back home to safety. Well, there's a scene in the movie where uh, the Texas Rangers are out there and they're just in the, in the deserts of the West and um, they realize all of a sudden that on the horizon there's a lone Comanche warrior. But just a few seconds later they realize that they are suddenly surrounded by a band of Comanche warriors and they are uh, in big trouble. And the only way of escape is straight ahead towards the river but they're not quite sure how far away it is. So the captain of the Texas Rangers, he uh, calls out to his Indian scout and he says, Mose, how far is the river? And this half senile man replies to him, I've been baptized, Reverend, I've been baptized. And I've seen that many times, but it hit me at one time that he's saying more than, than those filmmakers, than the writer of the book and the movie, more than they ever intended to say because that sentiment of, I've been baptized. That's a, a past event, and it has nothing to do with my current situation. Uh, that is the sentiment of so many Christians, and especially Baptists. I've been baptized. I've been baptized. That's a past event, and it has no ongoing connection to my current situation, my current salvation. And so as we think about that, why discuss baptism? What does it have to do with our current Christian life? Um, I realize that may seem like a strange question, particularly here at Rama. We're very pro-baptism at Rama. I learned quickly as, after coming as your pastor that when the time comes for us to have a baptism, I have four options of where we can hold a baptism. We can have a baptism here in this baptistry, in this sanctuary, or we can walk over to the chapel and we can use the baptistry and the chapel, or we can raise the floor and use the baptistry that's under the floor in the chapel. Or, if we're really ambitious, we can go out to the creek where so many saints who've been baptized here at Rama were baptized. We're very pro-baptism here at Rama. It's even in our name, Rama Baptist Church. So we understand baptism, but yet like that Indian scout in the searchers, far too often we fail to see what our present situation and what our past event of baptism has to do with our present Christian life. So for that, we turn to God's Word, and I hope you'll see with me that baptism is a very significant event, not just in the beginning of our Christian life, but as we continue until the Lord takes us home. For that, we turn to the book of Romans, Romans chapter 6. And if you found that place in God's Word, whether in body or in spirit, would you stand with me for the reading of God's Word? Romans 6, verses 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? We were buried therefore with Him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, 
by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. For the death He died, He died to sin once for all. But the life He lives, He lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. And the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the Word of our God stands forever. Let's pray. Lord, we thank You for Your Word. We're thankful for the gift of baptism, one of two ordinances that You've given us, Lord. And we know uh, that through Your Word we can understand how it has significance for our lives even today. So I pray that You would set aside all distractions, help us to shut out anything that would keep us from focusing on Your Word. And we pray that with open Bibles and with open minds and by the power of Your Spirit we would better understand Your Word and You would be glorified. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We understand that uh, when we get ready to study certain things in the Bible, certain doctrines, certain topics, there are some things that we immediately know we must turn to this passage. So if we want to understand the birth of Christ, we must turn to the beginning of Matthew and the beginning of Luke. That's where we're going to find the narratives about the birth of Christ. Or if we want to understand uh, the importance of the resurrection, we turn to the passage, passage Justin read from, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. If we want to understand the doctrine of Christ, who Christ is, there are many things we learn throughout the New Testament, but there are four passages that you cannot miss. That's John chapter 1, Hebrews chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, and Philippians chapter 2. If you want to know who Christ is, you must look at these chapters, these passages. But when it comes to baptism, we have to do our homework. We see baptism all over the New Testament. It's very similar to church membership. In fact, I would say it's the flip side of the coin in the sense that it's mentioned not explicitly, but it's understood implicitly all over the place. It's everywhere. Baptism is everywhere in the New Testament, yet we must do our homework to really understand what is its significance, what is its meaning. So the first passage we're going to look at is actually where we were in our call to worship is Matthew 28, 16 through 20. If you'd like to flip back there, you're welcome to, but you are familiar with the passage. It's our Great Commission passage. And we looked at that when we studied the three priorities of the church back in January. And since it was back in January, I'm sure it's right on the tips of your tongues. And so I'm just going to remind you really quickly what those three priorities of our church are. Our first priority is our relationship with God through Christ. Our second priority as a church is our relationship with one another as the body of Christ. And our third priority as a church is our relationship with the world. How do we relate to the world? What is the mission of the church? If we get these priorities out of order, things will not function as they should. Many churches attempt to elevate the mission of the church above our relationship with God. And they have the best of intentions. We think the mission of the church, that's pretty important. But if we don't rightly relate to God first, we cannot rightly relate to the world around us. And so as we think about the mission of the church, we saw then, and I'll remind you now, that the mission of the church is not uh, to redeem the culture. The mission of the church is not social justice. The mission of the church is to make disciples. Jesus Himself makes that very clear in Matthew 28, that we're to go and make disciples because He has all authority. He has all authority in heaven and on earth because He is victorious over sin and death. And because He has the authority, we're to do what He tells us to do. He's told us to go and make disciples. And what is the first mark of making a disciple? Jesus tells us it's to baptize them. Now you say, you're just saying that, Pastor Charles, because you're a Baptist preacher. That's what Baptist preachers are supposed to do. They're supposed to see baptism all over the place. But just as with church membership, again, Jesus determines the significance of baptism. He summarizes everything else when He says, teaching them to observe all 
things that I have commanded you. But what is the first thing he's commanded? Baptism. So baptism is a non-negotiable sign of a disciple. If someone seeks to follow Jesus Christ, the first step of obedience in following Christ is baptism. Now, almost all Christian groups agree with this. Only the Quakers and a few small groups like that would disagree about the importance of baptism. But as you know, we do have lots of disagreements about the who of baptism and the how of baptism. Who is to be baptized? And how are we to baptize them? Or does it matter at all? So we keep studying. You can turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, we looked at this some um, last Sunday as well. And so there's a little bit of, uh, of traveling that same road again as we see the early church in Acts chapter 2. You remember that Acts chapter 2 tells the story of the birth of the church at Pentecost. And uh, just by the providence of God, today is the day that many churches around the world celebrate Pentecost. They call this Pentecost Sunday. You remember that 40 days after our Lord's resurrection, He made many appearances to His disciples, and on the 40th day He ascended into the heavens. And He told them to wait in Jerusalem for the promised coming of the Holy Spirit. And there in Jerusalem, 120 believers were gathered. They were praying for the coming of, Holy, of the Holy Spirit. And on that 50th day, 10 days after the Lord's ascension, the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost. And so uh, many churches will celebrate that today. They'll call it Pentecost Sunday. But in the providence of God, we just happen to be in that same passage. And so I wanted to point that out to you. You remember as we've looked at that before, we mentioned last Sunday, at Pentecost the Holy Spirit comes and then Peter begins preaching the gospel. And what happens when Peter preaches? We see in chapter 2, verses 37 and 38. Peter gets the response that all preachers want when they preach the gospel, and yet only the Spirit can bring about this response. Chapter 2, verse 37, Now when they, that is all the people who were there, heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Repent and be baptized. As you probably know, there are some Christian groups who would point to this and they would say, see, it's as clear as the nose on your face. You have to not only repent, but be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. There are entire Christian denominations that would teach this, that baptism is essential for your salvation. Now for us to correct this faulty thinking, we only have to go to the thief on the cross. You remember the story of the thief on the cross. He's there hanging beside our Lord, and he's taunting Christ just like the other, the other thief on the other side of, of Jesus. And yet after a few moments, this thief on the cross begins to realize by the power of the Spirit that there's something different about this man in the middle. What he says about himself is actually true. And this thief says the most remarkable thing to Jesus on the cross. He says, Lord, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? What a remarkable statement, a jam-packed statement by a thief on the cross. And he says, will you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And what does Jesus say to him? Sure, after they get done baptizing you, you can be brought into the kingdom. No, that's not what he says at all. He says, today you will be with me in paradise. You will. There's no question about it. Today you will be with me in paradise. The thief on the cross did not have to be baptized to be saved. He had the authority of Jesus' words that Jesus says, you will be with me in paradise. Now there are many other places in the New Testament that we could point to and say, this explains why baptism is not essential for salvation. But we're just going to leave it at that. But I also don't want to stray too far from this idea. Some people would say, you have to be baptized in order to be saved. Baptism is essential for your salvation. And we would say, no, baptism is not essential for salvation. Therefore, it's just not that important. Sometimes we swing that pendulum too far the other way and we say, well, it just doesn't matter. It's not essential for salvation, so therefore it doesn't matter at all. That, that's really the response of a lot of Christians today in our society, in our culture, that baptism really doesn't matter a whole lot. But let's be clear. Baptism is not essential for your salvation, 
but it is essential for obedience to Christ. It's the first mark of obeying Christ to follow Him in baptism. Again, look at that close connection there in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized. It's all in how you're saying it, the emphasis that you put. Some people want to connect and say it's essential. We would say no, but it closely follows right behind. Just as the New Testament has no category for someone who would profess to be a Christian and not be a part of a local church, the New Testament has no category for someone who would profess to be a Christian and not follow Christ in believers' baptism. When we think about baptism in the New Testament, we could express it a few different ways. Baptism is what the New Testament would call our profession of faith. Now, for many of us, for the last 150 years in American Christianity, we've called the profession of faith when somebody walks down the aisle and they fill out the card. That's their profession of faith. There's nothing wrong with that. We're going to continue to do that. But that is not what the New Testament calls our profession of faith. What did we see here in Acts chapter 2? It's when they're baptized. It's when they go public, as someone has stated it. It's that public statement of identifying yourself no longer with your old way of life, but with Christ and His church. You do this through baptism. Another way you could think of it would be a someone wearing the team jersey. Woody, can you imagine if somebody's playing for the Georgia Bulldogs and they refuse to wear the team jersey? It's inconceivable that somebody would play on the team and not wear the jersey. But yet some Christians would say, I'm on team Jesus, but I'm not going to wear the jersey. I'm not going to be baptized. It's inconceivable in the mind of the New Testament. So to answer this first question, the basic question, the one that we pretty much all agree on, who should be baptized? Using language from last week, it's only true confessors. Only people who truly believe the gospel of Jesus Christ should be baptized. That means we don't baptize babies. We understand that there are many good Christians who just simply disagree with us about this. They will be in heaven with us, and the Lord will straighten us all out then. They're faithful Christians, but we have a serious disagreement, so much so that we can't be a part of a church together with someone who wants to baptize infants. We don't find that in the Scriptures. But we also understand that that means, like historically, we don't baptize someone just because they live in the community. We see the, the welding of church and state throughout church history, and we'll, we'll mention that a little bit later in the sermon as well, but too often people would baptize someone just because they lived in the area. And that gives them a false assurance of salvation. They think, well, I've been baptized. I've been baptized. But they don't actually know Christ. And so it's important we understand the who of salvation, only of, of baptism. Only those who truly have trusted Christ should be baptized. But what about the how? How should we be baptized? Well, this is the part I see some of you. You've got the twinkle in your eye. You're ready. You say, I know the answer to this question. We should baptize by immersion. And the reason is because the Greek word means to go under. And you're correct. That is part of it. The Greek word baptizo, we've just brought that into English. You hear that. Baptizo, baptize, baptism. We've brought that over into our English language. And the Greek word means to immerse, to submerge, to go under. Uh, during those times, if a, if a ship sank, they refer to it as being baptized. It was immersed. It went under. But that's not the only reason why we should baptize by immersion. You say, oh, I know. It's because Jesus was baptized by immersion. And again, you're right. But it doesn't go far enough. Yes, I believe part of Jesus' baptism, part of the reason for that is because He was setting the example. He was identifying with fallen humanity. He was being baptized with His people. Well, that's not all of it. You say, well, what about the other examples we see in the New Testament? Yes, those are important too. We, we look at John chapter 3 and it tells us that John the Baptist went to a certain place and he went there because there was much water there. Now, if you're just sprinkling or pouring, it really doesn't matter where you go. You'll have plenty of water. But the Bible is clear that John the Baptist went to this specific place to baptize because there was much water there. Or you could look at Acts chapter 8 with the story of uh, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. And as they're traveling down the road and Philip explains to him uh, the message of Isaiah 53 and, and the Ethiopian eunuch trusts Christ right there in the chariot going down the road. And he looks and he says, look, here's much water. What does hinder me? What prohibits me from being baptized? 
And Philip stops and they baptize him right there. And the text is clear that they go down into the water and they come up out of the water. It's very clear in the New Testament that baptism is by immersion. But these are not the only reasons why. Here's why I believe immersion is essential for proper baptism. Because only immersion properly pictures the spiritual reality of what's taking place in that moment. Only immersion properly pictures the spiritual reality of what is taking place. Let's dig into that, and for that we go to Acts, I mean, excuse me, Romans chapter 6. Flip back in your Bibles to Romans chapter 6. We've seen the who of baptism. Baptism is for believers, for true confessors. And we've seen the how of baptism. It must be by immersion. But I want to focus the rest of our time on the why. Why does baptism matter at all? And what importance does it have for us in our ongoing Christian life? For this, we look at Romans chapter 6, and I, I want to just say something very um, enlightening and revolutionary for you. Romans chapter 6 comes right after Romans chapter 5. So to understand Romans 6, we're going to look at Romans 5 for just a moment. In Romans 5, Paul is talking about the great salvation that we have, peace with God through Jesus Christ. And he explains that in Romans chapter 5. And he talks about how all of humanity fell through the one man, Adam. And he talks how the one man, Jesus Christ, came and per perfectly fulfilled the law. And he has those comparisons there. You can read that in Romans chapter 5. But when we come to the end of Romans 5, you see two verses. Uh, verses 20 and 21 of Romans chapter 5, and they say this, Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, or where sin abounded, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Paul says something that I'm sure most of you are familiar with. He makes that, that statement that where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And so that leads to the logical question that he's answering here at the beginning of chapter 6. What is that logical question you see there in verse 1? What shall we say then? Are we to continue, continue in sin that grace may abound? If grace abounds when sin abounds, does that mean we should just keep continuing to sin so that the grace of God would just keep continuing to flow? What is the answer in verse 2? By no means. If you're reading from the King James, it says, God forbid. The only problem with that is that Paul is a good Jew and he wouldn't speak that way. But the original Greek just says, Meganoita, may it never be, by no means, under no circumstances whatsoever, not at all, is that what we're to think. We're to never think that just because God continues to pour out His grace when we sin that we should just keep sinning in order that the grace would just keep coming. He says, by no means, how can we who died to sin still live in it? Well, what does that mean that we've died to sin? Some Christians would look at that and they would argue this teaches that you can reach a point of sinless perfection. You have died to sin, and if you're dead, you can't do anything, so therefore you're just not going to sin anymore. You've died to sin. But we know that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible doesn't teach sinless perfection. But it does teach us that sin is no longer our master. Before we come to Christ, we are controlled by sin. We can't help but sin. But after Christ has freed us, sin is no longer our master. We do still sin, unfortunately. We sin far more than we ever want to because of the change of the heart that Jesus has given us. But we don't live in sin anymore. One person has explained it this way. He says, you think about a house that you used to live in a long, a long time ago. And then you pack and you move and you go to a new house. You may travel by that house again. You may stop and look at it and have some memories, but you don't live there anymore. We no longer live in sin. Unfortunately, we're going to visit sometimes. Unfortunately, we're going to sin far more than we ever wanted to. But we don't live in sin. We are not controlled by sin. We have died to sin. But we keep reading. What does it say next? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized in His death? How have we died to sin? Well, the text tells us that we were 
baptized into his death. We died with Christ. Verse 4 says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. How have we died to sin? It tells us that we have been baptized in death with Christ. What does that mean? We know that when we, we think of our great salvation, we think of Christ dying on the cross in our place. And yet the Bible tells us that in one sense we also were nailed to the cross with Him. As the song says, it is well with my soul, our sins were nailed to the cross. And we bear them no more, praise the Lord, O my soul. We were on that cross with Christ. Our sins were with Christ. He has taken that penalty for us. We have been baptized into His death. Now what does that mean? When we, we look at these verses, Christians throughout the ages have said, we see this word baptism, but what is it talking about? Is it talking about spirit baptism, or is it talking about water baptism? They would say, you Baptist, you just want to see water baptism everywhere, all over the place. And they say, it's not talking about that, it's talking about spirit baptism. And we understand what spirit baptism is. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul tells us that by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. All Christians, at the moment of salvation, you're baptized into the body of Christ. You become a part of Christ. We've been baptized into Him. But what is it talking about here in, in verses 3 and 4? Is it talking about spirit baptism or water baptism? I think when we ask that question, we're trying to put a division in the text that Paul did not intend. You see, spirit baptism and water baptism are so closely related in the New Testament. One is a spiritual reality, but the other is the physical reality that's acting it out. Water baptism is a picture of spirit baptism. And so when we read this, we understand that, yes, he's talking about a spiritual reality, what has happened on the inside at the moment of salvation. But it also helps us understand the significance of water baptism. It helps us see what is happening when we enter into the waters of baptism. We keep reading in verse 5, it says, For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. So we put all this together and we understand that why the old Baptist from 400 years ago said that baptism means you're being dipped for dead. That's where the title of the sermon comes from, that hundreds of years ago when they were looking at this idea of baptism, that you're going under, you're being dipped in the water, you're dipped for dead. You are dead in your old way of life. You're, uh, you're picturing what Christ has done, that He has died in your place. So we put all this together and we see the picture of what water baptism represents. What's going on when you were baptized and when I was baptized? And what do we need to be thinking about the next time we see a baptism? What is being pictured here? One thing is being pictured is our confession about Christ. That we're saying that Christ died for our sins. He was buried, just as we go under the water, He was buried in that borrowed tomb. But on the third day He was raised to new life, He ascended to the right hand of the Father, and He has promised that He will come again. This is what we're confessing in our baptism. You say, I didn't realize that at the time. That's okay. But that's what we're doing when we go through baptism. We're picturing what Christ has done for us. But not only are we making a confession about Christ, that's part of the picture of baptism, but we're also making a testimony about ourselves. And this is where we understand the ongoing spiritual significance. We read here in the rest of these verses and, and try to understand what he's saying. Look at verse 6. He says, we know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. As we said, sin is no longer our master because of what Christ has done. Verse 7 says, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Verse 8, furthermore, if we have died with Christ... We believe that we will also live with Him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. Again, that's the passage that Justin read from 1 Corinthians 15. O grave, where is thy sting? O death, where is thy victory? Christ will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over Him. 
Verse 10, for the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now again, we would break this down further if we were going through a normal exposition of the passage, but I want to help you see what we're picturing in the ordinance of baptism. What happens when we have a new believer in Christ, someone who is following Christ and they're following Him in believer's baptism. We see that there's a confession about who Christ is, that Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. But more than that, we also are making a testimony about ourselves. We're seeing our salvation pictured in the waters of baptism. I've spoken to you about this before, calling it the three tenses of salvation. Salvation past, salvation present, and salvation future. All of that is pictured in our baptism. Think back upon your salvation. You remember that there came a particular point in time when you went from death to life. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but Christ gave you a new heart. You are now in Christ. That happened at one particular moment in the past, and you are safe with God forever. You are saved. There's no chance of losing that. You are in Christ. That is salvation past. We call that justification. If you're reading in the King James there, you may see in, uh, where it talks about that we have been uh, justified with God. Verse 7, for one who has died has been justified. The ESV says one who has died has been set free from sin. That is your salvation past. You're justified. But remember, we're trying to figure out what does this past event have to do with our ongoing lives? We see that we're saved in the past, and we've pictured that in baptism. But in baptism, we're also picturing our ongoing Christian life. We call that salvation present, our sanctification, that God, through His Spirit, is making us more like Christ. By the power of God's Spirit, you are no longer under the, the mastery of sin. Sin is no longer your master. You're not in the, a slave to sin anymore. And so you may look back over your life and you say, you know, I'm not where I want to be. But I can look back and I can see a year ago or three years ago or five or ten years ago and you can see there used to be a sin that I struggled with. And I'm not where I want to be, but I have more victory over it now than I did then. Some of you, it's your testimony that when Christ saved you, you immediately stopped former sins, former ways of life. Christ just set, set you free from that, and you never struggled with that again. Praise God for that. But for many of us, there's, there's certain sins that we just have to deal with throughout our lives. But as we grow in Christ, as Christ's Spirit continues to change us and sanctify us, He makes us more like Christ, and that is our sanctification. That is our uh, present tense salvation. But you remember also that that's not the end of the story. That not only are we in this life, but we have hope for the future. We have hope for our future life in Christ. That Christ will return. And Christ will either in death or upon His return will take us to be with Him. And when Christ returns or we enter into His presence through death, we will be immediately freed from the, even the presence of sin. You see, back at salvation... God through Christ has already taken away the penalty for sin. You don't have to pay that. No matter what else happens, you won't pay the penalty for sin. And in this life, He's continuing to free you from the power of sin. But ultimately, on the last day, when we are with Christ forever, we will be freed even from the presence of sin. We won't have to endure sin's presence ever, ever again. Now, how do we picture all of this in baptism? As you enter into the baptismal waters and the pastor takes you under the water, you're symbolizing that you have died to your old way of life. The old Doug has died. The old Tommy has died. The old Barbara has died. That way of life is gone, never to be seen anymore. We have died to the old way of life, but not only have we died, we have been raised in the newness of life. We are just as Christ was raised from the grave, we also are raised in the newness of life to never again live in the old way. That doesn't mean we're perfect. That doesn't mean we never struggle with sin, but we ought to see a difference in who we are now because of Christ than who we were before we came to know Christ. But furthermore, as we picture what do we normally say, raised to walk in the newness of life. We're picturing that because Christ has raised us, He's made us new creations, we ought to be walking in a new way of life. We ought to look differently than we looked in the past. And we're on this walk with Christ until He returns. Because as we 
picture in baptism, we see that Christ was raised from the grave. He ascended into heaven. He promised that He will return. And when He returns, He will take us to be with Him. All of this is pictured, our salvation, past, present, and future, all of it is pictured in baptism. This is why immersion is the only proper method of baptism, because only immersion fully gives us this picture of the inward spiritual realities. And when we understand this, it gives us a brand new significance when we watch someone else's baptism. Because we're only baptized once. We don't get rebaptized over and over. Anything else is just playing in the water. We're baptized one time. But then when we see somebody else, some of you, you might think, it's been a while since my baptism. That's okay, because every time you see someone else being baptized, you can be reminded that this is your story, this is your song, that Christ has freed you from the power of sin, that you've been raised to walk in the newness of life. What a beautiful picture believer's baptism gives us. As I mentioned last week with church membership, this is not something that's new to me. In fact, again, we are Baptists, and so this has been passed down to us. We stand in a long line of people who understand the Scriptures about baptism. And I want to tell you a story of one of those uh, groups of people. On January 21st, 1525, a group of about a dozen men were trudging through the snow in Zurich, Switzerland, and they made their way to the home of a man named Felix Mons. These men had been studying the Scriptures together for quite a while, and they had come to the unalterable conviction that baptism was only for believers. This may sound very common sense to us. We've just talked about it. We're not, we don't have anyone at the door threatening to, to kill us because we believe in believer's baptism. But this is the 16th century. This is the time of the unholy, the unbiblical wedding of church and state. And so to teach something that's contradictory to the doctrine of the church is to also teach against the government. It's open rebellion against the government. And so these men have been studying the Scriptures, and they've talked to the leaders in town, the church leaders, and the church leaders have said, we'll have to talk to the city council about it. And these men have said, the city council has nothing to do with this. We see what the Scriptures say, and we must obey. And so on that cold January 9, 1525, these 12 men uh, in the home of Felix Mons, they uh, discussed it. They knew what they were doing. They were taking their lives into their own hands. But one of them, uh, one who was a little more impetuous, said, for God's sakes, please baptize me. And so they take a bucket of water and a ladle, and they poured the water over the first one. Yes, at that time, the, the Anabaptists, as we've come to call them, that first night they uh, baptized by pouring. But it wasn't long until they realized quickly, just a few months, that the Scriptures taught immersion as well. But when they did this, they, they pictured what's most important is that you're only baptizing believers. And so each of them that night, as they're baptized there in the home, of Felix Mons, they realized that they were doing something that literally was putting their lives on the line. Because they're teaching something against what the proper teaching of the church was, the teaching of the state. This made them heretics by the definition in that day. And while we praise the Lord that we don't do this to heretics anymore, in that day if you were a heretic you were put on trial and you most likely died unless you recanted for your beliefs. And all of those men uh, to the best of my knowledge, within a matter of only two years had died because of this teaching of believers' baptism. But I want to tell you about one of them, Felix Mons, the, the man who owned the home that they were gathering in. He quickly became a leader within the group. He was very popular, very well-spoken. And so the government knew and the church knew that they could not allow this man to continue teaching these things about believers' baptism. He was too much of a threat to their current status quo. And so, like so many during that time, they arrested him, and they put up these false charges. And when we read these things today, we think, oh my goodness, these things are so, they're just so common sense when we read Scripture. But it was so far removed from what the church was teaching at that time uh, that they put him on trial, and they tell him, you will either recant or you will die. And praise the Lord, he did not recant. He said, these are what the Scriptures teach, and so I must hold fast to the Scriptures. And so they decided, the, the council said, we will seal your heresy in baptism. By that they meant they would execute him by drowning him in the river. And so Felix Mons, early January of 1527, again just two short years later, 
He was bound and he was marched away from the jail toward the Lamont River. And as he's going along his way, uh, the crowds are gathering, they're watching him, and he's witnessing to the crowds all along the way, telling them the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, telling them that, that infant baptism does not save them and they need to follow after Christ and follow him in believer's baptism. And as they approach the river and you have these crowds gathering around him, there's one voice that raises up above the others, and it's the voice of his mother. And she's crying out and she says, Felix, be brave. Don't deny the Lord who bought you and saved you. She knows that in that moment he will be excruciatingly tempted to deny the truth of the gospel. But Felix stayed strong. He proclaim the gospel to every person along the way. They get him to the river. They load him up in a boat. They go out into the middle of the river. And his final words were, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he was thrown into the river to die a martyr's death. I don't tell you this story just to move your emotions. It is a moving story. Anytime we read about someone who's willing to die for the faith, especially when we live in the lap of luxury here in America, but I want you to see that something that we so often downplay, believer's baptism, we just take it for granted. It's just who we are. We're just Baptists, and so we believe in believer's baptism. They understood that baptism was the mark of being a disciple of Christ. And that's what we are all about, is making disciples of Jesus Christ. And so Christ calls us to deny ourselves, to take up our cross, and follow Him daily, wherever that may lead us. And so I'm here to ask you today, if you haven't done that, if you haven't followed after Christ, if you haven't taken up your cross and seeking to follow Him daily, would you repent and would you turn and trust Christ? And if by chance you're here today and you have trusted Christ, but your baptism was not on the right side of your conversion, if you were baptized as a child or perhaps you realized that you thought you were saved and you were baptized at a certain point, but you truly came to trust Christ at a later point in life and you've just kind of kept that quiet. You've said, I was baptized, it was out of order, but that's okay. That's all right. We don't have to be embarrassed about that. We can talk about that. But it is important. And so I would encourage you to, to make sure that your baptism is true. But for those of us, most of us who are here and we've trusted Christ and we've been baptized at the right time and we've followed after Christ, I would ask you, are you walking in the newness of life? Does this picture of baptism mean anything to you at all? Are you continuing to seek after Christ and follow Him? And if not, I would urge you today to pray that God's Spirit would reawaken in you a desire to follow Christ, to seek after Him, to follow Him on this path of discipleship. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the goodness of your word. We thank you for the gift that you've given us in baptism for what we picture when we follow you in obedience through the waters of baptism. And Lord, we're, we're thankful and we praise you that we don't live in a world where we take our lives into our hands simply for believing your truth. But we know that that day may be coming. Would you help us to love you, to love your word, to love your truth, to love your son so strongly, so devotedly, that no matter what we're threatened with, that we would seek to follow Christ. May that be true of each of us here today. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our hymn of response, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. All of that had been written when those Anabaptists were uh, giving their lives for the sake of the gospel. That is the sentiment and the heart of what they would uh, say to us today, to trust Jesus in all things. Let's sing. Let's stand together. Just to know. 
Thank you, and you may be seated. As I made mention in the sermon to our three priorities as a church, did you notice in our first hymn, uh, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship, it, it essentially has our three priorities. It says, Let us love our God supremely. Let us love each other too. Let us love and pray for sinners till our God makes all things new. See, I told you, I didn't make it up. It's just an idea that's been around for a very long time. It's in the Bible. And as we think about our first priority of our relationship with God through Christ, as we've talked about that before, our desire is to let God's Word abide in us and our words to abide in Him. And so as His words have abided in us through the preaching of His Word, the reading of His Word, let's take a moment now that our words might abide in Him through prayer. Let's bow as we pray. Our God, in the beginning You created the heavens and the earth. And your power is shown forth in creation. And in the end, you will create the new heaven and the new earth. Your power is again shown forth as you conquer the death brought about by Satan. You establish your creation as a place of righteousness and peace. Your majesty will then be fully revealed as all mankind will come and bow down before you, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Our Father, we pray for this city in which we live. We pray because we know that there are many, many people here who remain dead in their sins. They're imprisoned by Satan's deception that you are not real. They are convinced that they face no judgment from you upon their death, and they are persistent in rebelling against you. And although you have created them in your image, Lord, they do not reflect you by their words and by their actions. Our God, even as you will create a new heaven and a new earth one day, we pray that you would also create new hearts in those here in this city. Our God, we grieve when we think about the fate that awaits all of those who rebel against you. This grieves us not only for the sake of the lost, but also because of your great name. Lord, would you show your power, your grace, your mercy to this city by redeeming the lost by your word and spirit. For your great name's sake, Lord, would you take many in this city who are dead and make them alive? Would you conquer those who do not give their allegiance to you as king? Would you renew their hearts and their minds and give them a new name, Christian, bringing them into your kingdom to enjoy the new heaven and the new earth, all for the glory of your name? Lord, we pray for us as a church. We pray that you would embolden and enable us as the body of Christ to be faithful witnesses to these truths. We pray that you would give us the ability to live and serve now in this present creation with our eyes fixed on the new creation. We pray for humility of character, that uh, we would not hinder your gospel by our pride. We pray for wisdom and understanding, that we would know your word well in order to communicate it to others. We pray for perseverance under opposition that we would not fear mocking or scorning. And we pray for peace and unity within our church and among all the churches of this area that believe your gospel, that division would not taint your message of peace. We worship and adore you, our God most high. May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I trust that as we have drawn near to God through the shed blood of His Son, Jesus Christ, that our Lord is pleased with our worship here today. Visitors, we're so glad that you're here. Uh, if you haven't done this before, we would love for you to take a visitor's card and to fill that out so that we could have more information about you, so that we could pray for you uh, and serve you in any way possible. And you can just drop that in the offering plate on the way out. Uh, our members and regular attenders, if you have not already done so, you can place your offering in the offering plate on the way out. And I also want to make you aware that next Sunday, fifth Sunday, we will take up our special uh, fifth Sunday benevolence offering. So either use the envelopes that have been provided to you, make a note on the check, whatever you need to do to let us know that this money is set aside for benevolence. And for all the money that we take up for our benevolence offering next week, is it's going to go to a family here in the community um, that are in great need, and they have a, a great pile of medical bills, and they would uh, greatly appreciate hearing uh, from the Church of Jesus Christ that God cares for them. And so uh, we have the privilege of gathering money to do that next Sunday. So I would encourage you to, to be here and to give generously to that. Another way that we give back to the community is through our food bag um, and ministry. And so the preparation of those food bags is this Tuesday at 10 o'clock. 
Uh, and the distribution will be Saturday at 2 o'clock as usual. Um, for whatever reason last month, whether it was the weather or whatever else was going on, we, we had a, a good amount left over, and that never, ever happens. And so if you know someone who is in need, um, please make them aware of that. If, if you're in need, please make yourself available to that. We want to help and serve you and pray that the Lord would make this a fruitful ministry, that we would not only uh, meet physical needs, but that we would also meet spiritual needs as well. Um, be reminded that there are no Wednesday night activities this week, and so uh, consider that a Memorial Day gift and enjoy that time. We will begin gathering uh, the following week for uh, prayer meeting and choir rehearsal. Also be reminded that next Sunday is Justin and Taylor's last Sunday here. Uh, if you weren't here for that announcement last week, uh, we will have a basket available next week. If you want to uh, leave cards of encouragement for them, you're more than welcome to do that. Also on this table, on your way out, there is a sign-up sheet for 1 Peter journals. We're going to start studying through 1 Peter uh, at the beginning of June. And so we want to uh, be responsible with, with your money as a church. And so we don't want to order what we don't need. And so if you're interested in that, please be sure to put your name on that. And if not, uh, don't sign it. And we will uh, be sure to order those in a timely fashion. Uh, I know the next Sunday is Memorial Day. Many of you may have plans, but I want to give you a heads up. You've been wondering, oh my goodness, he's talked about church membership. He's talked about baptism. What is he going to talk about next? Next Sunday, I trust, will be a, an encouragement and an edification for you from God's Word. We often focus on what Christ has done for us in the past through his atonement, through his resurrection. But have you ever wondered what Christ is doing today? Next Sunday, we will consider the doctrine of the ascension, that Christ has ascended into the heavens, and he is actively doing things on our behalf. So we will consider that next Sunday. Justin is going to come now and uh, lead us in one final verse before we go with the benediction. Let's stand together one more time and sing of Calvary. As we go this week, be blessed by this uh, final benediction from God's Word. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace.